Welcome everybody to this nonprofit digital marketing benchmark report. I'm so excited because I was thinking like, this is not like a report card, but it kind of is. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what all the comments are and what this benchmark report um, was about. So you're going to learn how nonprofits provide insights into their approach for digital marketing, website, email, and social media. So this should be really, really good. I'm sure a lot of you have been here before, but I have to say this. Please uh, engage in the Q&A for us um, if you have any questions. If you need the closed caption, just tap on that CC button at the bottom of your screen. And this is being recorded. You're going to get the recording and the slides within 48 hours, maybe later today, um, uh, maybe later today. So look for that in your email. And for those of you who are watching on the replay, let us know um, in the comment section how you like the webinar. I just have a few quick announcements. We rarely make announcements, but um, Grant Station is going to have their sale with uh, TechSoup 14th and 15th. Yeah, February 14th, 15th. So you're going to save $600 off of Grant Station. This is access to thousands of funders. And Alex um, and Cynthia, Alex is the president of Grant Station. Cynthia is the founder of Grant Station. They're both going to be here to give you a webinar. So that is tomorrow. So make sure you sign up for that tomorrow. And then on November, November, where am I going? I know the year's going fast, but it's not that fast. Slow down. February 13th, Data Commons is gonna share how you can make it easy for your nonprofit to get access to public data. So you can use that information to share stories about your work and your impact. I'm gonna move out of the way and go ahead and turn this over to our speakers. We have Joe here, he's a co-founder of TAP Network and Jason, he's a director of development. Welcome, I'm so excited to hear this report. I'll see you guys in the other end, bye. Sounds good. Great. Well, hi everyone, my name's uh, Joe DiGiovanni. I'm one of the co-founders of TAP Network here with Jason. Quick background on, on uh, my experiences. I've been in marketing for about 25 years and I was originally a biologist <laughs> starting out. Got tired of cleaning test tubes and, and went into marketing. Um, and very, very exciting times back in the day, working with uh, Oprah, helping launch her health channel and some real big brands working out of uh, Madison Avenue in, in Silicon Valley. And then about 10 years ago, uh, really sat down and, and thought, how can we how can we transfer this technology and knowledge to the nonprofit space and want to create a unique organization that did both marketing and, and technology. And with a partner like TechSoup, um, it's been an exciting uh, journey as we, as we reach nonprofits all over the world and, and excited about this benchmark study we're going to talk about today. Jason. Yep. And so my background is more in sales. If you're on our webinar from December, you probably heard a little bit from me as well. I'm excited to join the team here at TAP and kind of bring my unique perspective to these conversations. Um, having worked in both the for-profit and nonprofit sectors, you know, my goal is ultimately to identify the best strategy for your individual operation and deliver on your desired outcome. Um, short and sweet, you know, I, as you'll see in today's webinar, this normally is, requires a multifaceted approach based on your individual organization's needs, you know, because your strengths and weaknesses are all over the place as we find with most nonprofits. So we'll jump right in. Um, TAP, if you guys are unfamiliar with us, uh, we are a mission-driven marketing technology agency that is proud to partner with TechSoup now for over seven years. We serve, you know, about 300 plus nonprofits like you each year and would love to, you know, help you out if possible. Our mission is to provide nonprofits with affordable access to the knowledge, tools, and technology from today's fastest growing business sectors so they can ultimately solve society's most pressing challenges. Uh, in more layman's terms, we help organizations identify growth opportunities you know, within their existing marketing technology, um, having both a technology side and a marketing side on our team. Uh, we, we can kind of you know, provide both options and that's kind of where the magic starts. So our services range anywhere from website development and CRM integrations to the marketing campaign design strategy and implementation. Uh, with that being said, I hope our presentation enables each of you to identify areas where you have room for improvement. And if you need our services, we would love to help. Joe, you want to walk through the benchmark study for us? Sure, great. Just some, some quick background. Um, and you could download the benchmark study from this slide. We'll send the slides right after the conversation. And Aretha will um, also pop a link in, into the chat. 
But the benchmark study, we first did the benchmark study right when COVID hit. And it was really a wake up call learning about all the nonprofits in terms of digital resilience and transformation to see if they were prepared to, uh, to adopt, quickly adopt to the rest of the world in the business world in terms of their, their marketing and technology. And a lot of folks were in dire straits um, because a lot of things were still being done by paper and pamphlets and, and billboards and, and whatnot. And then we just recently did a follow-up benchmark study uh, this past summer as we were coming out of COVID and it was really exciting to see how far nonprofits has come over, over that period to digitally transform a lot of the things they're doing in terms of social media, email adoption, CRMs. So the survey will go through each piece um, and it's a, it's a nice way to compare how you're doing with your peers and then see you know, how do you bridge that gap or, or take a leadership role in, in your sector. Uh, the, the survey was completed by 110 uh, nonprofits in the United States. So in terms of the agenda, next slide, just give you some feedback on where we're going today. We'll review the, uh, the website benchmarks, and then we'll dig into advertising, content marketing, email marketing, and social media. And then we'll switch gears and look at marketing technology, all the pieces that fuel all this from CRMs to CMS and, and marketing automation. Well, I'll jump in here, Joe, and I'm gonna go over the website portion. So for website benchmarks, you know, your website's your, that 24 seven mission driver. It never sleeps, it doesn't go on lunch and it doesn't take vacation. Your website's job is to convert prospects into participants, volunteers, donors, and most importantly, evangelists of your brand. Evangelists are that key to any budding organization becoming and maintaining relevance in today's market. I know today's market is harder than ever. And so how do we help you do that? You know, these evangelists are the early adopters or supporters of your mission, and they really will propel you into the future so that you want to make them, you know, the biggest supporter as possible. So does your website provide the tools these evangelists need to champion your mission? How, you know, why and how can your audience get involved? What impact does, this, does their involvement bring? These are all questions your website ultimately needs to answer so that they have the tools they need to help you grow. You know, one of the main factors in maintaining relevance is ensuring your website hosts routinely updated content. And to enable this, you know, the first you first need to ensure that it was constructed in a way that is easily accessible and update, you know, can be updated by your staff without having to bring on someone else. That kind of leads us into a, our CMS discussion, one of those anacronyms Joe was referring to. So what is a CMS? You know, this is a content management system. Think of this as the backbone or foundation that your website is built with. It allows for easy accessibility and changes to be made without having to learn to code. You know, the matrix is what probably a lot of you are thinking, right? So here are some examples of common CMS systems we see in today's market. Uh, Wix and Squarespace you see in the top left, uh, are both more for brochure style website. Easy to get in and use, easy to start, but limited in function and scalability because they're trying to be easy user experiences. Uh, meanwhile, our team is more, you know, we, we use WordPress as our go-to. It's free to download and use, best for SEO and, and integrations, and ultimately is the most scalable because it provides access to hundreds of thousands of unique plugins uh, that can allow us to custom tailor the website to your individual needs. Both Joomla and, and Drupal are also open sourced, similar to web WordPress in that they allow, you know, customizations, but they have a much steeper learning curve and often are more for, they need a lot more custom development. We like to think of those as more, you know, portal-like for applications that require more really support overall to launch and evolve. So your choice of CMS can have major implications on your team's self-support capabilities and so we want you to make sure we want to make sure you're thinking twice if you are considering rebuilding your website to understand what implications these have. Um, while laying out and creating your website, it's it's just so important to to make sure that you're thinking about this, you know, right in the beginning. So I want to jump in right to one of our first benchmarks, and I was kind of surprised that our survey results were that 53% of our respondents don't even use a CMS for their website. So we either have some hardcore coders out there uh, that are simple, or people are just unaware of the benefits a CMS ultimately can provide. Hard coding a website is both time consuming and not supportable and not a really way to scale your business long-term 
because it's so time intensive for subtle changes. That's where a CMS really starts to shine and why our team uses them. Um, it's like doing long division in your head instead of using a calculator. I mean, just don't beat your head against the wall. Save time and energy and put it towards your mission, not towards trying to change if an image is on the left or slightly on the right. You should be able to drag and drop and make it easy. Um, knowing that more than half of you are unable to reasonably make routine updates because you're not using CM a CMS, it's kind of no surprise to see that 30% of you are only making updates to your website when people are pointing out that there's issues. Maybe it's out of date. Um, and another 45% of you are reporting that you're making monthly updates with just a handful doing weekly. Uh, you know, frequent updates to your website are a key way to drive and boost your SEO, which is going to get you that organic search and get in, you in front of your audience. Because, you know, we want to make sure that they get they come back and they have a reason to routinely return to your website to get new information and content. It's just going to boost their likelihood of being involved in your mission. So having met with many of you personally, since I've been here at TAP Network and worked side by side with TechSoup, I want to highlight that typically this is not the result of people being lazy or lack of effort. If anything, they are trying extremely hard and just getting nowhere because their, their website it was not designed to be supported by someone that can't code. Uh, I'm right there with you. I couldn't do it either. So bite the bullet. Let's do it right. And let's get you going in the, in the right path. Um, a lot of this is just proper planning up front when you build your new website. Going to jump in a little further then, get, you know, as this kind of digs out and see. So if your team is part of the 50% that are looking to rebuild their website, again, leading into this, no surprise that a lot of you are looking to rebuild their website because you're not using CMSs. You can't make updates to your site. You know, we understand and we have a growth driven design approach that our team uses because we find considerable success, especially in the nonprofit world. Think of this as like a progress over perfection. You know, we want you to get in motion and reaping the benefits as soon as possible. So we start by getting those core pieces of your website set up so you can start taking donations. People can start connecting to why you're relevant and what impact they can have before we go on and building and optimizing it for each little nuance of what you do. Um, you know, should you choose to partner with our team for a future website build? You know, this is the exact process we would use. To implement. Joe, why don't you go, kind of go over a growth-driven design approach uh, so they kind of understand how this works? Sure. The uh, growth-driven design approach that was um, originated out of HubSpot, a, a CRM provider that, that uh, a lot of nonprofits collaborate with. But when COVID hit, it, it really came to fruition, this process, because nonprofits didn't have a year or two to rebuild their website and make huge investments. They had small amount of budget left over and they had to do it quickly. So this is really where growth driven design spread throughout the social sector. But the process really is, you know, you, you, you have a strategy and you want to relaunch your website. So you launch a launch pad website, which is basically a website that maybe has 80% of the things that you really, really need and you get it up quickly. And then once it's up quickly, you have time to really plan, develop, learn and transfer, um, information to continually improve the site. So let's say you launch your website and the first thing you want to test is volunteering. So you have a you build a volunteering land landing page, call to actions. You're putting social media out there around volunteering. And, and that's part of your plan. That's where you set your goals. And then you develop it. You launch it on the website and then you learn, you measure it for a month or two or three to see how it's performing, what can be fixed, and then you take all that information and you transfer it back to your fundraising team, your, your operations team, your marketing team, and you continuously improve the site. You might improve the volunteering aspect more, or that might work. And then you want to add in a fundraising uh, flow that's just as similar. So anyway, this is a great way to get a website either relaunched or a brand new website up quickly and then continually to grow it. So it's always firing on, uh, on all cylinders. And so, Joe, why don't you walk us through the email benchmarks so they understand kind of how we can start getting the eyes on the prize, getting people looking at the website? Sure. Once once people come to the website, the, you know, the main thing that you want to do is, is collect emails. Email, I believe, 
uh, is one of the most powerful marketing tools you can have. So if you look at emails, the three core pieces are things that you want to do is you want to grow your email database. Uh, the more people you have, the, the more opportunities you have to grow your, your nonprofit. Segment them, number two, and then nurture them. So that's continual emails, nurturing in terms of getting them to become members, to volunteer, to, to donate. So that's why we really think, you know, email marketing is important and, and a, a major piece of this, uh, of this survey. On the next slide, we, we can look at some of the, uh, the data here. 73% of nonprofits um, do not have a defined email marketing strategy. And like I said, really all the work that you're doing out there to meeting with people, having events, you're growing that email database. It's, it's your number one driver. So a plan is, is huge. So having a, an email strategy and an email strategy that is part of your overarching strategy is critical. And that's something that not going to cost a lot of money, but just some time to really think think that through. The next stat, 55% of nonprofits do not have the ability to segment audiences. Um, when, a, when a nonprofit first starts out and when you first started out, you know, it's you just have usually one big list and you're entering data from all different places if you're even getting it in there. And then you're just, you know, throwing spaghetti against the wall, basically even though with one message that's hitting all different audiences. And as a lot of nonprofits mature and grow, they're, they're able to segment. Um, but what we're seeing is over half of nonprofits are not segmenting and they really do need to segment because you're gonna have different types of audiences in terms of donors, funders, members, volunteers, and the ability to segment those audiences is really where, where uh, email marketing can, can improve a lot. So. Yeah, in terms of you know, next steps, you rev up your email marketing by having email collection forms, have a plan on what to do with that data when you get it, make sure you can segment those audiences when you, when you do market them, and then think a few steps ahead like a chess game in terms of what emails that you wanna send in succession to convert folks to donors and funders. But as far as the landmark benchmark study goes, this is one of the things where nonprofits can make a, a quick improvement without a, a huge investment. You know, Joe, Joe, thanks for going over the email portion. Uh, do you want to jump into social media as well? And so they can understand some of this as well. Sure. Uh, social media, this is, uh, you know, we went pretty in depth in the study on, on this. What's important about social media, it's, it's top of the funnel in terms of raising awareness. It's mid funnel because you're engaging people on social media and then social media with the you know, new tools and technology. It's also bottom funnel. You can, you can you know, do peer to peer funding, fundraising and, and drive donations on, on social media. So as you go through the report, you'll see uh, how in depth it gets. And, and today we'll go over some of the, the metrics to see where folks are, are standing out. Great, thanks. So on this slide, we asked nonprofits, what social media platform are, are they using, right? So Facebook is number one. It's not a surprise there, but, but the other folks are, are catching up. Facebook, it's great for, like I said, fundraising. It's the best not platform out there to fundraise. If you're just asking for donations and advertising in that manner, you're not going to get a huge you know, it's Facebook is still the best, but, but you're not going to get the best ROI. It's really about the peer to peer fundraising. And that's where social media really, uh, Facebook really takes off. Instagram is great for building awareness and, and showing impact. Twitter, that's more used for policy and, and, and driving uh, change. LinkedIn, great for corporate fundraising and recognizing funders and other. Uh, the majority of which we're, we're seeing a rise in, in TikTok. TikTok is becoming a great platform uh, along with Instagram Reels and YouTube to educate folks about your nonprofit or, or your mission. So really it's what, what a lot of folks need to do is, is look at these different platforms and align them with you know, the, the goals and strategies that you have. It's not just, oh, I'll use Facebook because 84% of other folks are using it. It's, it's what you're using it for. And as you download the study, you'll, you'll, you'll see more information in, in that regard. On the next slide, um, let's see, here we go. 
how often should I post? This, this, is, um, this is curious data too. Almost 40% of nonprofits post three to five times per week, um, which, which is good. It's gone up a lot since the last landmark study the year before. 31% post one or two times and 22% one to two times per month. So a huge increase in terms of frequency and the amount of nonprofits that are, that are posting on social media. Again, you, you really need a plan. So it's not just posting the post and you, know, you might just post once a week or five times a week, but if you're measuring everything and it's part of a plan and part of a targeted strategy, that's, that's really most important. And you know, the more frequent, the better, but, but doing it right is, is equally important. The other question people were always asking me put on the study, should I be using Facebook for fundraising? 56% um, of nonprofits are not using Facebook for fundraising. Um, it's an easy to set up on Facebook to, to get the fundraising going. So there, there could be a quick lift there. And um, of that 44% that do fundraise using Facebook, 90% um, of them report fundraising efforts to be extremely successful. So your peers are out there doing it. And if they're doing it right, they're, they're seeing a really nice ROI. So Facebook's the first place to dip your toe in, in terms of uh, reaching new donors and, and supporting peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Again, and if you download the study, we get into a little bit more detail on that piece. The next slide, um, just, you know, if, and what we're trying to do here is show the data and then give some tips and techniques on, on how to get started. So at, at the top of the funnel with Facebook, you know, a lot of nonprofits are using it to build awareness and that's a great opportunity to do that. Um, so maintain continuity across your social media platforms, have a message that you really define when you're laying out your branding and, and get that message across and use Facebook at the top of the funnel to build awareness. And then think through the call to actions that you have, because at the end of the day, you want people to come to the website, collect their email address or convert them right on the website. So the call to actions are, are important and it's always great to uh, A-B test those call to actions on your social media. And then most importantly, and it goes back to the beginning of having a, a strategy for your website, having a strategy for your marketing, create a content calendar, measure your results and continue to optimize it in that growth driven approach. And you can make some big, big enhancements in terms of your, your uh, social media usage from awareness to the, uh, to the fundraising side of the fence. That's a perfect pivot, Joe, to our marketing and marketing and technology benchmarks as well. I think this is more of that big picture, like you said. Um, I'll let you jump in there. Sure. So uh, what's changed a lot lately is in, in terms of technologies, marketing automation has really been part of B2B, business to business, business to, commute, to consumer um, out, out in the corporate world. But automation, thanks to to you know, just advances in constant contact to MailChimp to larger um, pieces of, of software like HubSpot, marketing automation is, is much easier to use, drag and drop, and it's easier to uh, implement on, on your website and into your marketing campaigns. Um, marketing automation could be everything from someone comes in from social media, they come to your website, you collect their email, it gets segmented into a database, and then they get put into an automated email drip campaign. And if you write all those things up, pull them from your, from your content calendar or your plan, you can automate all that. So imagine the amount of time you could spend you know, writing every email, writing every social media post. For a lot of nonprofits we work with, we do all this a month in advance. So all the media posts are approved, they're set in the automation, the email uh, workflows are all set up. Everything is, is tiered to go. And then these campaigns start running in your sleep. So marketing automation is, uh, has really taken off in the last few years for nonprofits. And we can see some, uh, if you look at the data on the next slide, um, we're starting to see automation uh, take hold. 34% uh, use email automation, which is nice to see. Again, 
there, it gets even more in depth once you start adding more automation in, in terms of your website. But just starting with email is the quickest, easy way to, to get automation going. Um, this could be thank you emails from donations, donating nurture campaigns. So you might have a set of emails that say, hey, thank you for coming to our big gala. And then you can showcase, you know, the community that you're impacting on the second email and then the third email you're asking for a donation and then thank you you're asking to refer somebody but all these can be set up um, everything from the end of year donation reminders to anniversary donations um, th there's a lot of different ways this could work so we see some in terms of the benchmark study it's nice to see 34 percent are using it but there's still a lot of uh, room to grow there So the next portion we're going to kind of go over are CRMs or constituent relationship management managers. And, you know, 54% of nonprofit organizations studied don't use a CRM and 11% weren't even sure. So kind of bringing this full circle with what Joe's talking about, about with the automation, how we can email and collect information. This is where a CRM ultimately helps. So we've talked about top and middle of funnels. So this is the bottom of funnel. How are we collecting information? How are we getting in touch? How are we tracking these people? Um, I, this is really where this comes into fruition. Um, think of a CRM as that central repository for all your constituents' information. This doesn't just include whom they are, but also more importantly, their interactions and their interests. This allows you to segment them, understand who they are, and then remarket to them through social media or however you want, email blasts. Uh, common examples of CRMs are like Salesforce. Uh, on a really, really light end, yes, you could say maybe constant contact, but uh, or HubSpot, stuff like that. And HubSpot is a great example. This is a very marketing-centric CRM, and we're a HubSpot Platinum partner, and it helped integrate this into hundreds of nonprofit organizations. We find it's ideal just because it's so easy to use and grasp and it's so marketing focused. So you can have it integrate directly to your website. So those call to actions that Joe was speaking about and talking, you can create those forms right in HubSpot, link them to your website. And now when someone comes in and they want to donate their time, you can have the form and you know exactly what they're interested in. It makes it really easy then to market to them later about, hey, we need a couple more volunteers for this initiative. You know exactly who to reference. Um, just as an example, but contact management, lead management, can do emails, share documents or files. The biggest piece that I like is the, it allows you to measure your conversions on your website and from your marketing. It gives you that one repository where you can track what's been successful, what haven't, what hasn't been, and where should we spend our next marketing dollars to see if we can make a bigger change. So HubSpot does offer more of an all-in-one digital platform. We do have an option to do that through TechSoup as well. We can help train you and get you started there if you think this is a good fit for your organization, or if you're not sure, we would love to talk to you about it. Um, anything you want to add there, Joe, on the CRM? No, I think, you know, HubSpot is a nice all-in-one platform and they have, you know, a free, a free platform to test, to test it out with up to a huge enterprise level as well. So it just depends on the size of your organization, but it basically covers email, social media, website management, all, all those different elements. So next steps wise, you know, would love for you guys to all to download the marketing benchmark uh, report if you have not. Um, if you have any needs or feel that you could, you know, need help in certain areas, please reach out. You can go to, and Aretha, if you want to share these links, you could go to Tech Service, uh, Tech Soup's uh, website resources or marketing resources and the team here at TAP would love to help you in whatever regard you need. Um, we are going to review a little bit of that and we will share this download. She has the download for the report as well uh, where you can fill that in and get the report yourself. Marketing web support wise, I will kind of go over briefly what we offer so people understand kind of ways to get involved. Uh, we do start website construction right around $3,500. Uh, this is more of a starting point and a way for, just to get in and get started on a core website. Um, these services are expanded because we love to tailor our websites to your individual mission. And so they can expand up towards 10,000 plus depending on needs and goals. Biggest thing to focus on here is that we do use that growth-driven design approach. 
So we can start small and scale when you are ready. Yeah, and all these services that Jason's reviewing, they're all offered on TechSoup as TechSoup services. We're, we're the exclusive provider and they're all, you know, have that discount built in uh, that TechSoup provides. Correct. And from there, I mean, the other way, I mean, a lot of people go, hey, well, my website's not that bad. I just need help making a few updates, making a few changes. We need to maybe, you know, help write in our homepage. We need to add in an integration. We have marketing service retainers where instead of your team having to have that intimate knowledge, you can bring us on to get some mis your mission accomplished at whatever cadence you want. So if you want something where we get involved for a few hours each month, we would love to help you in that regard. Or if you want us to kind of discuss a bigger project where we're doing multiple integrations, we can do that as well. Just book a meeting and we can discuss. Joe, do you want to kind of go over the marketing side? I mean, that was the website side, but the marketing side, we have a lot of offerings there as well. Sure. We have, uh, again, as, as as Jason said, every nonprofit's different and we always you know, aim to customize our, our services, especially along the marketing side. Um, yeah, it, it starts at $4.99 a month. That gets you a block of hours to do all these different types of things, search engines, social media, analytics reporting, branding, custom graphics, all these different pieces that, that you might need. Um, and you might not have a chief market officer or a digital designer or a marketing technology specialist. So you get your own team who, who can do all these different things, including put, put a plan together for you. So yeah. If you have any specific questions, we, we basically get on the phone and try to come up with a customized plan that, that meets your budget. Speaking of plans, Joe, why don't you kind of go over the marketing strategy and audit as well? Because this is one that we get a lot of requests for. Sure. Before, you know, a lot of nonprofits make a heavy investment in marketing and advertising. What, what we do is come in and put together a marketing strategy and audit. And that, that includes a, some technology audit as well in terms of CRMs and CMSs. But basically, we come in, we'll do a discovery. We'll look at all your different target audiences, your goals um, and the competition out there, whether it's other social and whether it's other um, nonprofits or public entities that are in, in a similar space and we'll put together a, an entire plan for you. So that's from the awareness stage through uh, SEO, from, from blogging to advertising to social media to the middle funnel, which is engagement. So we'll look at what type of blogs should you be putting there, infographics, webinars, webcasts, anything that'll help educate uh, folks once they're aware of your nonprofit. And then the bottom funnel, which is really where the CRM kicks in and we're looking at email drip campaigns and, and ways to convert people at the bottom. So whether we want people to become fundraiser, to, to donate, to you know, corporate fundraising, to volunteering, to having folks engage into a, your particular program. So we'll put the whole plan together um, and it also includes you know, recommendations for technology and it's something that you could use whether you do it yourselves with another partner with TechSoup and TAP, regardless, you'll have a whole blueprint on, on how to you know, basically run a marketing and, and the technology you'll need for the year to, to hit your goals. Essentially, it's a blueprint, a blueprint that you can follow and we can be involved at whatever level you want. It's a fantastic offering. Ready to get started? By all means, reach on out. I know Aretha's already provided the links where you can see our services. We would love to help. Um, and next part is we can go through some of these questions, Joe. Yeah, uh, that'd be great. Change my screen so I can see them. I appreciate everyone sh taking the time to join us today. And let's jump in. So I'm going to start with Deirdre. It sounds like you're looking at HubSpot as not only just for a CRM, but also for a CMS. Um, you'd love to tie the user journey together, but you're worried about some of the limitations. Uh, I would say that's more of a question that we could discuss based on your actual goals. Not that 
HubSpot is still can definitely be used as a CMS tool as well, but it depends on ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, I, that's definitely more of a specific discussion based around with a lot more questions involved than a easy yes or no answer. Um, the, the, but WordPress does offer very seamless integrations as well. So both are definitely for consideration. Yeah, I think I think HubSpot is nice because from a, a CMS standpoint, without getting specifics of, of your organization, it, it enables you to create content, you know, and, and publish it right onto the website, it could, you know, from blogs to the calls to action, link them to a campaign and then link them into your CRM and into your contacts and your database. So the nice thing about HubSpot is all, all those pieces are integrated and then you can actually label them as as campaigns so the content and the conversions and all the let's call them deals which which could be related to you know getting someone to actually uh, donate can can all be tied together the other thing we can do with wordpress is wordpress can serve as your cms we have a lot of sites that are on wordpress but then we'll tie in hubspot for the landing page and to do all the automation and the two work uh, seamlessly together. So some, some folks do that as well. But like Jason said, if, if you want, reach out and we can do a deeper dive for you. Try and jump in here. I'm not familiar with Firespring CMS. I'm seeing that one from an anonymous attendee. They're asking about Firespring uh, as an open source CMS. I know our team, as far as I know, we are not experienced with Firespring. Uh, definitely would recommend if you're looking for something customizable to you uh, to look at WordPress. And to give you guys an idea, we don't just use WordPress and that's it. We definitely have a suite of plugins that we've identified as being ideal for creating websites like Elementor, a drag and drop, what you see is what you get tool. And so it's the not just WordPress, but the combination of a few best in breed plugins that we use to create a site experience that is easily supported by less tech savvy staff in the long run. The goal is you can easily log in, make updates. If your board members change, you can make those changes to, you know, pictures, titles, all that can be done easily without you having to incur costs uh, of hiring someone to do it for you. There's a question from Janet around how on updating web Website regularly, how often do you recommend we add content to optimize SEO? Um, yeah, so add, adding content, again, it depends on, on the size of your staff. If you could do, you know, if, if you're just doing one, one blog a week would, would make a big difference. I think you'd be ahead of 80, 90% of, of the nonprofits out there. And then, you know, the more that your blogs link amongst each other as a, as a source of truth, uh, the, the further you can optimize that that content, and then if you if you tie social media that drives folks to those blogs, that'll have more traffic to them, which which raises your SEO. So a nice benchmark uh, would be about once a week, and if it's original content, e even better. But again, it depends on the size of, of of your nonprofit and what you're trying to do. But that's a nice place to start. Once once a week would be ahead of every most every other nonprofit. I'm looking through here, Joe. A lot of these are more in your wheelhouse around Facebook, YouTube. Yeah, the um, here's here's another one about timing on social media posts. Again, with with the you can either use you can actually use the platforms be, be, you know that that Facebook and Instagram provide to look at to look at your data or you can use Sprout Social. You can be using even HubSpot to, to see what what posts perform perform better at at what times. Um, generally, the rule of thumb is you want to get a nice cadence to your post too. I mean, Tuesday could be you know tip hot tip Tuesday. Monday could be you know something else around fundraising and the rest of the week is is geared towards education um, educating folks so it's not all all about sales and, and trying to, to drive the fundraising but yeah i mean for all the clients that we have it's it's just a matter of putting something out there for uh about a month measuring everything looking at what timing a b testing and and ultimately and, and improving it so 
you know, there's, there's some rules of thumb of trying to get content out right when people wake up, you know, 6, 7 a.m. On, on your own time zone. And then 4 or 5 o'clock, usually when people get done work, is another time and 10, 11 when, when people are going to bed. But it just depends on, on the type of post. So the key there is, is really about measurement. I see one down here from Paul. Paul, you talked about uh, what our views on Wix as a website development tool. We think Wix is a great starting tool for websites. Depending on your individual needs, uh, it can be a fantastic tool because it's easy to get involved with, easy to support, uh, but it is more for a brochure style website. So something that's less complex and just sharing information. If you need complex integrations to to CRMs, you want to do a lot of the marketing stuff we talked about and kind of grow your business out. Um, it oftentimes will limit your organization though. And so that's why we rely on WordPress uh, versus like Wix in a Squarespace. Just gives you a lot more room to grow long-term. Yeah, a lot of our, our clients come to us. Um, it's, it's, it's when they transition from Wix or Squarespace. They, they, they launched the website on Wix or Squarespace. It was more brochure-like. Um, and then once they really wanted to get into more driving people towards events and, and the automation side of the fence is when we start to evolve them onto the words, WordPress and, and, and sometimes a, a HubSpot-like platform. Another neat one I see on here, Joe, is uh, thoughts on AI providing a boost in every area we spoke about. Um, yeah, I'm gonna pass. A, I, great question, by the way. Yeah, so AI, I mean, it's it's evolved so much in the last few months. It's all over the media, and I think it's a great tool for nonprofits. You can you can use it to create subject lines and headers for you know for your emails when they go out um it, it'll do that you can use the chat sbgtt you can use surf for seo there's a lot of different platforms um but to run down the list you know you can use it across the board if you're creating content it's really and anyone could use these tools but it's a, it's what you feed into it to, to get the best response so if, if you're writing a blog about you know how, how to prevent diabetes through a healthy nutrition, um, it, it'll write that and it'll be very accurate. And then what you need to do is, is then pepper in, you know, how your, your nonprofit supports diabetics and how to get in touch and then specific case studies and things of that nature. But it's a great way to get a head start and, to, and, and laying the foundation down for, for your blogs. And then as you, become an expert at it, you'll know what to feed, what, what information to feed into these AI platforms to get the best result. And then you have to really add your own experience and insights on top of them, but it will save you tons of time and, and, and money doing that. And it's really great for writing headlines. If, if, you know, if you're writing a blog some, or doing a webinar, just the headline of it alone can double or triple the amount of people that read it. AI is great for that. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to become prevalent across the board, but it's still going to be, you'll, you'll still need the experts, expertise in feeding the machine and then, you know, linking all this content appropriately amongst each other to further raise SEO. Otherwise, everybody's going to be in, in, in the same boat. But if you can get a jump on it now, is, is the time to do it. We can walk you through some examples as well on, on the best way to get started. It's great for emails too. So yeah, it's it's here to stay for sure. Super, I think it's super exciting. I mean, it's, it, but yes, right now definitely needs to be managed and reviewed and it's not gonna take away anyone's job um, as we speak. I would say definitely, Definitely review the content because sometimes it makes some correlations that one would not find normal. <laughs> There's some interesting things it can come up with. Um, let's see here, Joe. What else do we have? We have, I, I think some of the Facebook questions are great. You know, how impactful do you find Facebook advertising is one question by Naomi. And also, uh, she stayed away from Facebook fundraisers because of her understanding that they don't share donor data. Uh, when people engage in the donation programs, so it's is it a worth is it a worthy trade off to engage in Facebook style marketing if you're not going to understand who your audience is you're speaking with or who's donating? Can 
Can you hear me? Yeah, I see. Here's a here's a great question. What is what is the priority list? Um, generally, we kind of look at at the website as as being the priority number one. Making sure that your your messaging is succinct and the workflow when people come to the website from a user experience standpoint is there. And once once that foundation is set up, so we know someone comes to the website, call the actions there. We want them to get their email because they're interested in the newsletter. That email goes into the database and we know, you know they could be a funder, they could be a volunteer, et cetera. But setting up the website is really number one and making sure because everything that you do is going to be re, it's going to be re sent there so then once that's done it's it's generally facebook because you're going to be driving folks there and then the email to to continue that conversation so hopefully that's helpful but really again that foundation set up on the website is is the first priority and joe i want to circle back i was asking you that for your thoughts on the on Naomi's questions around Facebook marketing, uh, what your thoughts are there? Do you see? Do you see the questions? Sorry. Sure. On on the Facebook marketing, um, you know, if we, we've seen a lot of folks use Google, the Google Ad Grant to to advertise on Google, and and that helps. And then there's the the second place people generally spend money is is Facebook. But you're, you're not really seeing the ROI. If, if you put an ad out there about your nonprofit and you want folks to, to donate, the let's say the cost per click is a dollar, right? So every time someone clicks on your ad, it's a dollar. And you get maybe 10% of folks who, who click actually fill out a form. So now you broke even. And then another 10% actually donate. Well, then you're you're spending ten dollars for every dollar that that you raise so with 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 you know trying to raise through certain platforms it's important to really to do the math if you're spending money in terms of advertising if if you're trying to do it organically the best route to go especially with facebook is find the, the 10 or 20 people that are super passionate stakeholders and take the time and effort and investment to set them up on a peer-to-peer fundraising platform, whatever one you may use. And in general, we, we, we likely see between $500 to $1,500 raised per person who takes a personal story, puts it on Facebook, and pushes it out to their own uh, audience. That's generally, the, I think, the best ROI in terms of marketing on, on Facebook. If you're huge and you're united away and you have a budget and the brand recognition, yes, it might be worth spending ad dollars but otherwise that peer-to-peer -peer personalized fundraising seems to have the best roi yeah it, it, it's really what you're doing is i know in the beginning of our discussion we talked about the evangelists and how you want to create them to bring your relevance you're giving your evangelists that tool they need to help you raise revenue because they already know they're already bought into your mission and so now they can go out and help capture funds to further what you're trying to accomplish Yeah. Uh, someone asked, is there any other platforms that allow for news posts other than WordPress? Because WordPress is a really high learning curve. Uh, Depends on what you're trying to get accomplished there. Joe, do you, I'm thinking the answer is absolutely yes, there are, but it's really got to do with how your website was set up and designed. Um, sharing content should not be something that's largely laborsome for you long-term. You should have an easy way and templates designed to easily get in there and link content that you would like to share with your target audiences. Yeah, I mean, the, since w WordPress is so what you know the widespread use there's there's a ton of news type templates if you go to um a website called elementor you can you can look at all the different news uh templates that are out there and pick and choose the different features that that you want um generally that's that's what we 
not that we use elementor we, we kind of customize our own but if you're starting from scratch that might be a nice templated platform that that uses wordpress hope that helps um but but generally that's mo most new sites are built built on wordpress yep the idea is just to make sure it's drag and drop easy to like manipulate and it's what you see is what you get so it, again, going back to, you don't have to know how to code to be able to use it. I uh, see there's someone asking in terms of monthly donation program, what type of plugins do you recommend to add to my donations page? We use WordPress. There are a myriad of donations softwares out there, tons to really go through and many options. Uh, one that we've seen a lot of success with recently, I know is Give Butter because it allows for easy integrations to a lot of common softwares and it's free to get started. Uh, there are others as well, like Little Green Light. Um, what other ones, Joe? I'm trying to think, but Give Butter is the one I've seen a lot of success with lately. Yeah, Give, Give WP is, a, is, a, is one of the most prevalent ones as far as plugins go. Um, so I think that might be the best to check out. I know Stripe has a has a plugin that can accept donations. But yeah, the, give WP is probably the most used, most secure that, that we've seen. I think any. What do you think about Google Sites, Joe? I see a question. Any insights on Google Sites and how it can be used with HubSpot or any other CRM platforms? I'm not familiar with Google Sites at all in that regard. Um, I think it's, it, Google Sites is typically used as people's first site as an easy place to get started, but typically people move away once they're ready to get to that CRM level and ear and integration level. Is that in, wouldn't you say that's correct? Yeah, generally we would we would scrape the content off of those sites and then put it into the, the platform that you want to evolve to, like likely a WordPress, but some folks start with Google and then move to Wix and, and, and up the chain there. Yeah. I think anything else? Any other ones that you want to you want to jump into, Joe? Yeah, I think I think we covered. Most of them, again, if, if you guys have any questions, feel free to um, cl click on the links that Aretha provided and we can set up a call to do you know, more in-depth deep dive in, into what your specific needs are. Um, but, but we're here to help. We've been a partner with TechSoup for, like, like we said, seven years and, and everything that we do is through TechSoup. So you get, um, you get the expertise in terms of all the other platforms and services that TechSoup offers. As you know, we integrate and work with all the different partners like Microsoft and, and Adobe and everybody else. Couldn't agree more. Well, I appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, would love to talk to you in, in further depth if you're interested in discussing your individual needs or ways we can help. Um, anything for you, Joe? No, that's great. <laughs> appreciate everybody's time. Thank you, everybody. Make sure you fill out the survey and we'll send these links out to you um, later today. Thank you. Bye-bye.